of our application development teams uh, use our platforms to, um, to run and develop uh, key applications that some of you might, have, uh, might be familiar with as Comcast customers. So these platforms can include things like, uh, like OpenStack or VMware and obviously Cloud Foundry. Um, just a quick note, um, next week for the OpenStack Summit, we're also going to be present there. So anybody who's attending that, we look forward to seeing you at that, uh, at that conference as well. So anyway, um, I sit on, a, on, on our cloud architecture team. So we provide strategic direction for cloud services. And uh, it was actually our team that, that made the decision to go with Cloud Foundry as opposed to some of the other PaaS providers that exist out there. And I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd welcome any... Uh, conversation about why we decided, why we made that decision uh, with any of you uh, throughout the conference. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is a, um, is a challenge we, we came up with in supporting custom URLs for our customers. Um, so I'll be talking to you about that in a little bit. Um, Sergey um, is our, our application platform architect. And uh, what he does is he works with our development teams and makes that they are leveraging proper architectures and design patterns that fit well within the cloud. I think everybody's aware of the 12-factor app, um, and Sergey is the, the champion for that in our company. So he, he's going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the custom service brokers that he wrote that, that provide a lot of value to our, to, uh, uh, our development teams. Um, Sam and Neville are our cloud engineers, and they work on our engineering team, and they're going to talk to you about what it's like to um, take Cloud Foundry and run it within an engineering team and what kind of change in mindset that takes. Uh, so that will, that will be pretty interesting as well. So first challenge I'm going to talk to you about is custom URLs. So this seems like a relatively easy uh, uh, problem, but it, it, it added some complexity for us. Uh, obviously, Cloud Foundry supports um, custom domains within Cloud Foundry. Um, it allows people to choose their own host name so that their URLs can be whatever they want to make it. Um, however, um, when, when you add things like um, uh, global availability, uh, making sure that the, a, a single site can be hosted on multiple Cloud Foundry instances, and then the URL hosted at uh, a GSLB layer so it can be uh, globally avail or geographically available, um, can present some challenges. Um, that URL, once it makes it down to Cloud Foundry, um, how does it route that traffic now that it's, it's, it's trying to handle a URL that is foreign to it? And, uh, and it has to be supported on both sites. Um, and then how do you enable SSL for some uh, situation like that? And then also, how do you make it on demand? So um, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is uh, HTTP host header replacement. So, Basically, when the URL makes it down to a local Cloud Foundry instance, um, we have our, our load balance layer do uh, header replacements on the HTTP layer. And what that will do is allow uh, Cloud Foundry to understand where to route that traffic based on um, how our HA proxy layers uh, translate one URL into a locally hosted URL. And, and that would enable GSLB support um, so that people can uh, have a, a globally available URL that uh, translates properly once it makes it down. And then multiple SSL certificates. So when you have multiple URLs that need SSL enablement, you're going to have a bunch of certificates. And those certificates will, um, will need to be hosted on your HA proxy layer. And there are going to be multiple, HA proxy, or multiple certificates for a single HA proxy layer. So that presented some challenges for us as well. How do we get around that? So what we do is, is we leverage Puppet. So um, Puppet is responsible for making sure that um, the HTTP header replacements are uh, properly injected into the HA proxy configs. And uh, we put Hira in front of that so that, it, so that the, 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 um, the values are stored in a database. And what that enables for you is that you can put any web server in front of that, any UI that you want to put in front of, of your Hira database. And it'll dynamically update the database and dynamically update Puppet and then update the HA proxy uh, layer. And that's, this works well for, HA, uh, for HTTP headers, and we can make it on demand for our customers. And it also works with, um, with SSL certificates. So if our, if our users need SSL certificates that are, that are custom or specific to their application, they could do it through that service as well. And as long as your HTTP proxy layer supports SNI, you can, mul you can um, support multiple certificates uh, for a single IP that's hosted on your HTTP proxy layer. 
So that's the first challenge I wanted to talk to you about. And um, next, I'm going to pass it off to Sergey, who's going to talk to you about uh, some of the really cool work he's doing with, um, with custom services and custom service brokers. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Sergey Matashkin, and um, I'm um, working on architecture team and mostly responsible for a layer between Cloud Foundry and our developers, our development community. Um, today, I want to focus about one aspect of Cloud Foundry is uh, managed services and managed services API interface. Uh, Cloud Foundry provides a great, very convenient way uh, to uh, create managed services like uh, MongoDB, you can instantiate, RabbitMQ, you name it. So Cloud Foundry comes with these managed services, and managed services allow to, uh, can be instantiated, can be created with just uh, one command line or, or a few API calls. Our developers, when we start to release Cloud Foundry to, uh, to our development community in Comcast, they immediately start to use it and they see value for development process because it gives them the freedom to start, um, uh, to start their backing services right away and use it and remove when they don't need it. So it's completely self-service. They don't need to help from anybody. But with this attachment, with this uh, likeness of, of, a, of a managed services, they start coming back to us and asking, is, is uh, say, Kafka supported in the a, in a managed services? If something else is supported in managed services? So we quickly realized that there is a good demand for managed services, and we need to expand our library of managed services with something that we need to create on our own. Um, First couple, um, a couple managed services that everybody asked and we feel that it's absolutely need to be created right away are Logger and um, Outbound Proxy. Um, Logger, this is, this is sort of obvious. Cloud Foundry has, um, um, has log aggregator, but um, the actual consumers need to be able to store this application log somewhere and be able to access and, and search them. And the second is a, is a, a proxy layer. A proxy layer is um, required for increasing security of our applications because we want to very strictly, very controlled communication between our applications and uh, partners or third parties like uh, Amazon Web Services and such. So with understanding of the need to extend our offering of managed service library in Cloud Foundry, um, we develop three principles that we need to follow to create our framework to extend the library development efforts. It should be easy and simple to use because, because we need to continue extending the library. And the last but not least is support service lifecycle. Particularly, we need to be able to update our applications um, on a, um, <coughs> without any major disruptions and, and uh, data loss. So with this, this in mind, um, we decided that uh, we want to use three building blocks, mix three building blocks together to, uh, uh, to build our uh, framework for managed services. And those building blocks are Cloud Foundry, Docker, and OpenStack. Uh, well, OpenStack, uh, OpenStack is a very convenient infrastructure as a service um, platform that allows us to, um, uh, to add compute or storage or network resources to um, our managed services platform as needed. So that, that, that is a perfect tool to support organic growth. Uh, Docker is here, well, it's just because, because it's Docker, right? Everybody loves Docker. We want to have Docker here. Uh, <laughs> That is actually just a half joke. We, we were able to justify, we, we were able to justify presence of Docker here. And the justification is Docker provides um, portability, so you can, you can develop Docker containers and, and, and you can guarantee that it will be run consistently across different environments. Um, second is Docker provides just right level of isolation that we need. And it's very economical to run because, because we can run multiple Docker containers on the same VM. It doesn't have much overhead. 
Also, Docker is convenient because Docker helps to support application lifecycle. We can do updates. We can use use Docker images to manage uh, to manage our service lifecycle. Um, so, with these building blocks, we need to put some some glue together uh, to to build the solution. And here on the right, um, you can see um, you can see a pool of OpenStack VMs that we run on OpenStack, and each of the VM um, at any point of time might run uh, multiple, several Docker containers uh, that actually each Docker container represents a service. Uh, to manage the pool, we have created a, a Docker pool controller. So uh, Docker pool controller is responsible to track and manage all the resources in the pool, including uh, VMs, including Docker images, Docker containers, uh, port allocations, storage, all this is managed by, um, by the pool controller that contains of three elements, container management, manager, database of the resources, and capacity manager. Uh, capacity manager is, uh, uh, provides constant, it it's evaluates capacity of the pool and um, ensures that at any point of time we have enough resources in the pool to spin up more services, to spin up more containers. Uh, so this way we don't need to wait for a new VM to boot. We already have pre-provisioned enough resources for next few services to start. Um, and container manager is the core of the solution. Uh, container manager is actually responsible for uh, spinning up, uh, bringing up new Docker uh, containers and services inside Docker containers or tear them down based on the uh, request from the consumer of this resource. And consumer is, is actually uh, uh, this, this, this element altogether all together, you see here is a, a service broker. So for those who are not familiar with the service broker interface and API in Cloud Foundry, uh, Cloud Foundry controller on the top, when it needs to provision a service, it talks through service broker API. So service broker API is very simple. It's literally like a five, um, uh, five uh, restful calls uh, that needs to be implemented. Service Broker API is defined, uh, is, is defined how uh, service, uh, how Cloud Foundry controller requests new services. Uh, that API is easy to use, but it has nothing to do with actual provisioning infrastructure. So that's why we put Docker pool controller to manage all the infrastructure elements. And uh, once we have Docker pool controller, adding new, uh, uh, new horizontal here pieces these this are our services in the library, becomes a trivial task. Just, just as an example, this is a technical conference, right? Uh, <laughs> I, want, I want to show some, an example of a, a request response to, uh, to Docker pool controller. So in this case, the um, service broker is asking, um, create, go, of, uh, go and create a new, um, a, a, a new uh, Docker container using um, uh, this specific image, Comcast Logger in this example. Uh, allocate one gigabyte of memory for, for, the, for this uh, container and expose a couple of ports, uh, port 80 and 5000 to the consumer. When Docker pool manager gets this request, it checks inventory of the resources available. It identifies the VM that can run that specific image that has enough memory and resources. It allocates ports for port mapping, port assignments, and start a new Docker container. Then it returns, it returns back to the requester information about that container, uh, how that container can be accessed. Uh, not, not exactly not the container, but the services. So it provides entry points to all the mapped services back to the requester. So that's, that was a sample of this call on this API uh, of Docker pool controller API. With this all elements in place, um, 
we now have, we now fulfill all our three goals. We can very easily extend uh, our library, our offerings for managed services because implementation of uh, this layer becomes trivial. Um, and we do all the provisioning of the actual infrastructure through very simple, straightforward API. Uh, we have scalability thanks to OpenStack, um, uh, OpenStack and Capacity Manager. And we have ability to, uh, uh, to manage um, life cycle of our services uh, through, through the mechanism that provided by Docker. Um, that's it on this part. And um, uh, the, next, the next section I want to, uh, to pass to, to Sam, to my friend Sam. Sam is uh, from engineering team, and he is going to talk about how introduction of a cloud founder and platform and service changed mindset of engineering and support team. Thank you. Thank you. I have a pretty busy uh, slide there, so I'll give you some time to take uh, pictures. <laughs> so hello, my name is Sam Guerrero, and as uh, Tim mentioned, I work on the cloud engineering team, along with my colleague, Neville George. Um, <clears throat> today, I want to spend a little time talking to you about our experience from an engineering perspective with implementing Cloud Foundry. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to let me share a little bit of our story with you today. This is my first Cloud Foundry Summit, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> so at Comcast, we have a really small engineering team compared to the enormous, enormous virtual footprint that we have. So the thought of bringing in a new architecture was a little daunting for us at first. You know, we thought <clears throat> there's a lot of things that, you know, may change for a service model that's been really successful for us. Um, but I had to remind myself, that's kind of something I was thinking about 12 years ago when I was handed eight servers and asked to see if I can get VMware ESX to run on them. Um, <clears throat> so over the last few years with infrastructure as a service team, it's our, the focus has really been how quickly can we deploy VMs and then how, you know, how can we automate those processes? Well, <clears throat> that's great for most teams. It's really an obtainable goal. Um, but it leaves our developers and application owners, our customers, with quite a few tasks to have to complete after receiving their VM or, or group of VMs. So I'm sure as most of you know, receiving a, a new VM kind of leaves you with a little bit of a black hole. I mean, you have a, a nice VM, but there's, a, there's, a quite a, uh, there's quite a few things to do with it after that. So we wanted to kind of change that for our customers. <clears throat> with, Cal with Cloud Foundry, you know, we've introduced a paradigm shift in thinking for our architecture and engineering teams. You know, we, we, wanted, we want to change our mentality where we really focus more on the, the end product of the, of the services we provide versus just kind of deploying a VM quickly. Um, you know, we have, to, we have to really focus on lowering those barriers of innovation for our product teams and our developers. So <clears throat> with Cloud Foundry, we really introduced a self-service model to our, to our teams for uh, application and developers, application owners and developers. Well, that's really decreased the time between release cycles for these teams and really helped them out. But the, the key to that agility is really a careful coordination between developers, uh, architecture, and, and engineering. You know, we have to be more involved end to end now to make sure that, you know, we, we are part of that process to offer more of a holistic service model and service offering. Uh, so, and we do that by kind of inserting ourselves further along the assembly line, if you will. Um, with, with Cloud Foundry, um, <clears throat> it's really offered, it's offered more of a self-service model for our application and development teams. Uh, so that, you know, with that, with that model, what it's doing for us is it's actually, um, uh, <clears throat> it, it, it's allowing us to, to be more engaged. And what we have to do now is we can no longer say that it's okay for us to give our customers a brand new car that they have to go home and assemble the transmission before they can drive it. Um, you know, we, we believe that if we make our factory better, everything else will improve. So we have, we have had some technical difficulties or challenges, not difficult, but challenges with, with most new things uh, in introducing Cloud Foundry. Um, <clears throat> some of those challenges have been, you know, having to maintain our CMDB to, to really uh, reflect back from Cloud Foundry to our applications. Uh, before, it was really easy. We had an application that we would map to a VM, that we'd map to an application owner or a group. Um, another thing is, you know, with, with network. So we've had to really expand a lot of the services we provide by now getting more involved with, you know, firewall and GSLB 
and load balancing, things that you know, we really didn't do before. They were really more on the application owner to figure out how to get their VMs to run. And then finally, you know, just maintaining Cloud Foundry itself, um, you know, learning how to, to, to deploy build packs and create custom build packs, how to in inter introduce new stacks, uh, you know, how we were going to uh, maintain just the releases of Cloud Foundry in general, which can be a little bit on the aggressive side for a team like ours that we really weren't heavily involved in a lot of open source or community driven projects in the past. So a lot of that was new to us. So we found that these, these technical challenges weren't really as big as we thought they would be, you know, and they've actually given us a lot of new opportunities that we didn't really expect. You know, we've, we've learned to really interface more with our customers where um, before, you know, we were just kind of in our engineering hole. We kind of did our, we gave it a platform and it was kind of your VM to take care of from then on. Uh, it's also helped us understand more about how the products that we provide and the services we provide really, you know, go to the end line, the, you know, the, the, what, what we're trying to really do at Comcast. So it's helped us understand what our applications do and how they affect the business and how, you know, we're more part of that process now. And it's also helped us become more uh, T-shaped engineers. You know, it's really increased our, our set of, of skills that we have, and it's really helped us kind of get developed and, and learn this new model that now we're part of, this DevOps model that, that's it's really exciting uh, place to be right now. So, you know, our, our experience with Cloud Foundry so far from an engineering perspective has really been positive. I mean, it's really helped us learn a lot of new things and it's helped us really focus and learn about, you know, all these products and the, really the end goal of agile product development and time to market. So, with that, I'd like to thank you one more time and I'd like, I'll pass the mic over to my friend, Neville George. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Hopefully you guys can hear me, right? Um, so my name is Neville. I, I work on the uh, cloud services engineering team along with Sam. Um, I would say Sam's a very nice guy, right? Um, every time uh, Tim and uh, Sergey come up with ideas, you know, we still have to support them and keep our sanity. So, you know, it's, it's very, um, very nice of him um, um, to do that. Um, so what I will do today is uh, talk about some of the operational aspects of um, Cloud Foundry that, you know, we have found um, you know, in our uh, Cloud Foundry environment at Comcast and, and some of the tools and, and things that we have done in our environment in order to support the, uh, the Cloud Foundry instance that we have at Comcast. I'll talk about some of the proactive monitoring stuff and also about, you know, visibility into your environment. Um, it's, it's related to Cloud Foundry, you know, and how, how they have helped us, you know, what we have done, what are the tools that we have used in order to support the environment. Um, so starting off with uh, proactive monitoring, right? It's um, the, the success of any um, engineering team is in its ability to actually prevent an outage, right? Pre uh, preventing, proactively monitoring, looking at the key performance indicators to know um, what is building up in order to make an outage, right? Um, in addition, um, you know, it would be great, you know, if you can actually re reach out proactively to your customers or even better, Right? If you can resolve problems, say for example, customer quotas, for example, right? if, if, they are, if they are developing, they are innovating, and they're starting to run out of quotas, you know, if we can proactively manage that and make sure that they have enough space and stuff like that, you know, it definitely helps, um, you know, helps avoiding that midnight call, you know, escalation call saying, hey, we're running out of space and things like that. Um, also, um, irrespective of how proactively you manage an environment, um, it's inevitable that you know, there will be outages, right? Um, so when, a, when an outage occurs, the most important thing is to make sure that it doesn't occur again, right? What are the, what are the, um, what are the additional configurations that we can help and proactively manage all these things before we actually um, complete um, handing this off to the operational team, right? Um, so we have uh, actually um, chosen Nagios, you know, for our proactive management. There's a lot of information available um, for you to um, configure, you know, what you want to monitor and, and things like that. Um, now, it might seem very simple, but in a very traditional company, um, most, most of the time you have um, off-the-shelf uh, off the shelf monitoring tools that are run by a monitoring team that has an SLA and that has an intake process, and all this takes time. Right? So what we have done is, you know, like, like Sam mentioned, the T-shaped person, right? So we manage the complete instance of Nagios, um, and, and we 
uh, make sure that we set up all the counters and key performance indicators that we need to monitor. So in case there is a problem and we feel that, you know, hey, um, X is not being monitored, we believe we'd be able to actually do that um, in, in, say, you know, five minutes, as opposed to like, you know, the OLAs and SLAs associated with the, with the team that is outside our control. Um, so moving on, um, you know, we'll talk about the visibility of the environment, right? Um, um, it's very important that, you know, we understand, you know, what is that in our environment and things like that. Um, so uh, Cloud Foundry has a great CLI that, that you can use to get a lot of information. The only problem is that it's not a single, single pane, right, where you can see everything and click through everything. Um, so we have had the same problems, right, and um, what we found is, you know, we found a tool called the Admin UI tool. It's available in the uh, Cloud Foundry incubator um, that, that we have used. Um, before I move on, you know, a show of hands on how many know, how many of you know about the Admin UI tool? Okay, great, great. We have, we have a few of us. Um, but for everybody who doesn't know, um, it provides a GUI interface, you know, for, for you know, um, knowing your organizations, your spaces, who has access to your spaces, how many spaces you have, your quotas, you know, um, what are the DEAs, uh, how, how are they um, being utilized, your utilization metrics of your DEAs, how many applications are running on it. Um, you, can, you can also, it also shows you, you know, the growth of your environment in terms of organizations and spaces and, and over a period of time how your environment has been growing. Um, it also aids in certain operational aspects. Um, so you could, you could create organizations using the tool. You could, you could apply quotas, you know, to your organizations and things like that. So it's been a very useful tool for us. So, um, you know, so that pretty much is everything that, you know, I had uh, on, on this slide for us to talk about. Um, I would like to close by saying, um, you know, Cloud Foundry has been great for Comcast. Um, having the uh, T-shaped people as well as, you know, having the run your own business kind of mentality has, has definitely uh, helped us make it better. So that is the end of the presentation. Now, um, I think we have a few more minutes, you know, for questions, so we'll, we'll start taking the questions. Right? Yep. Yeah, so uh, what's the size of your environment? Uh, so. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, has it turned it on? Just make sure the mics are off. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, we are running in production. I actually forgot that part. Um, yeah, so we're running in production. We have several key applications that are in production today. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a couple of environments, and we're scaling it every day. So we don't have any, um, it's not, I, would, I wouldn't call it a huge environment at this point, but we're definitely uh, ramping up and we have several application teams because of this platform and its usability um, are, are very interested. So we're gonna be just ramping up quickly. Yeah, you mentioned the automation you put around passing through the domain names of the GSLB. Did you also automate the configuration and the setup of the GSLB and it's all tied together so you can do automatic provisioning URLs? No, well, it's, it's yeah, so we don't we don't own that part of the network stack. So um, there's several options. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of services out there that are also self-service. So you know, there's options. Uh, I know a lot of some teams uh, that I've talked to um, can leverage uh, Route 53, and that that would work well in this scenario. If, if that's uh, let me jump on this on this question. So we actually we develop develop two models um, uh, to do that. One is. Uh, uh, for a simple use cases, we can have a, a centralized GSLB manager with a C names mapped map to a centralized GSLB management. That will be work for all applications that want to use this model. So this is not application specific. But if any, spe any specific application needs, you know, very specific health check and specific rules to fail over or, or share GSLB, then they uh, still today has to do it the same way as they did traditionally with the Non before before platform as a service was introduced. So two solutions currently. What processes do you put in place for training developers on how you built the environment, what to use? Maybe all developers are using Docker these days, but the few who aren't, how do you tell them? It's on the ground. <laughs> yeah. What's a training model. Um, I I can say we have we have a really good training model, uh, but we do. 
uh, we do onboarding, we do onboarding sessions with our development teams. We do brown bags to introduce, to do you know, some broad overview to have people aware. Um, we focus on 12-factor application um, uh, uh, model because I think that, uh, that is very important. On overall microservices model, how not just to shape your application, but also to shape data. So we have all this, that not, not very structured training with a, with a development team. And uh, to, to, to explain, because developers need to understand uh, the difference in how they need to develop applications for past compared to how they did yesterday. And, you, and we have some of our developers here today, so if you reach out to us afterwards, we can you know, hook you up if you want to talk to them as well. All right, uh, I, think I think we're, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you so time. much.